Hello, my name is Victor Lang. Several years ago, I met a remarkable woman named Sarah Howard and her husband Dudley. I contacted her by registered mail and asked if I could talk to her about her experiences in the Apollo program as one of two female test engineers who worked on the development of the first stage of the Saturn V rocket. My plan was to make a film from her recollections of her life, her photos, and the artifacts that always are part of a life well lived. Unfortunately, I started this project during a time when my life was going through a period of heavy turmoil, and it never came to fruition. Also, one of my backup drives failed, and I lost some of her interviews. But I didn't lose it all, and I've decided that I have an obligation to my friends Sarah and Dudley to make something, to make it as clear as I can how meaningful and inspiring I have found Sarah's life to be. Sarah, thanks for teaching me all that you have. Yes, 1957 when Sputnik was launched and a whole bunch of us kids were got really excited and uh, we went out at night and saw it go beep 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 over our heads. <laughs> My dad was furious and I'm not sure when our government thought about going into space but it probably was the launch of Sputnik. But anyway, um, no, we were really excited, and because of that occurrence, we decided, my dad and a whole bunch of adults and kids, to form an astronomical society, and it was a great success, and in fact, so many people came to the meetings, we completely fill the auditorium at Centenary College. And we had meetings once a month, and we had different speakers, wonderful people, scientists, astronomers, and my dad got them all. And we had a great time, and the society is still there today. Okay, in 1961, my senior year in high school, I had a bunch of friends, and one time my dad, I was in ROTC, and my dad, uh, we had, in Shreveport, there was Barksdale Air Force Base across the river in Bossier City, and it's still there today. And anyway, my dad called me and my best friend, A.W. Steed, to come to Barksdale Air Force Base and wear your ROTC uniforms. We didn't have a clue. And we said, oh, okay. So we went there and we went in a room and there were all generals and very important military people. And we were at one end of the room and all of a sudden the door opened at the other end and here walks Werner von Braun. I like to drop my teeth, but anyway, he came up to us very polite in his very cultured gem, uh, German accent and asked both of us, um, are you going to go on the space program? And I said, absolutely, yes. A.W. <laughs> wasn't interested that time. <laughs> He ended up being an airline pilot. But anyway, um, that was one of the highlights of my life. Actually, at the time, I didn't really understand how important that was. And later on, I realized, oh, my gosh, Werner von Braun is one of the best people ever. I mean, if it wasn't for him, we'd have no space program. And so I learned a lot about his life. And he was a very kind person, soft-spoken in his German accent. And so then we got together and stood together, and they took our picture. Well, I wanted to do something on the space program because I think Jim and I had, uh, I'm not sure if they've, 
finished. I, did, I graduated from college in 1965, mm -hmm. and um, I had been to a lot of colleges and universities because my dad paid for it, <laughs> so I got to go. And I graduated from LSU in a degree in mathematics and astronomy. And I got a job after college, and I was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I got a telephone call from one of my friends who lived in New Orleans, and she said, Sarah, whatever you do, drop it. Come down to New Orleans. They're hiring for Apollo. And I mean, I jumped in my car, and I was going 90 miles an hour, and I ended up... I went to the Boeing plant at Michoud, which is outside of New Orleans, New Orleans East. So I filled in an application, and it was 12 pages, both sides of my life from the time I was born to the day I was there. It was unbelievable. But anyway, I got all that done, and they said, we'll call you. And I said, oh, Lord, that means I probably won't get the job. But I waited. It seems like it was over a month. It was a long time. And I was working for the telephone company at the time. And so they called me and they said, uh, Ms. Howard. Oh, no, I was a Caldwell then. Ms. Caldwell, um, come on down to the plant. We have a job for you. Well, Nothing could have stopped me. <laughs> I tore down that road. It's a big highway and got to miss you. And um, I went in and I found out I'd be working for Boeing, which is a great, great company. In all my 30 years of working, Boeing was the best employer I ever had. They're wonderful people. They completely... Uh, delve into your whole life from the time you were born to the time you set foot in the plant. And then they said, you're hired. So I went in uh, the personnel section where they took my picture, they fingerprinted me, and I had a badge. I was so proud of my badge. So that started my career as a systems test engineer on the first stage of the Saturn V. And it was a hoot. We had more tr uh, more fun. It, there were a whole bunch of different um, uh, people in groups that were doing this, um, this work. And it was our duty to interpret all the data from the static firings to see what part were good, what parts were bad, what they needed to fix, what they needed to change. And I'm proud to say most all the firings that we uh, analyzed were perfect. We never had an anomaly. We never had a, a fault, nothing. They did it right. Boeing did it right, just like they do today. Boeing was the best company I ever worked for. They had a blockhouse. Everybody went in the blockhouse to watch the firings. Mm -hmm. We could not go. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had to stay in the plant and do our thing. They had a big roll of paper. It looked like a seismograph. This kid looked like he was 10 years old, had this huge cart with all these rolls of paper, and he would give them to each um each group, so everybody analyzed everybody else. But we never had any faults. They did it right. Warner Von Braun was a genius, unbelievable. And I was so honored to have been able to meet him. And um, a lot of people just, they didn't get to meet him, and I did, so I feel very fortunate. Well, the astronauts had the right stuff. But we engineers had the real stuff because we were the ones building all the stages and testing all the stages. And I'm glad to say we never had a fault except on the second stage at Michoud at the plant where I was. 
where there was a terrible accident, and it ha that's kind of a long story. Um, an administrator decided he was going to come do a test, and back then you did not question a supervisor. And anyway, so he tried to, he did a test, he thought he was doing a test. He blew up the entire stage. It's in my book, and you can see the pictures. And it was totally wrecked, and there were people that were working on the second stage, Chrysler, and they were furious. They wanted to get in their cars and go to the Mississippi test site, test site and tear him limb from limb. <laughs> And the supervisor at Mishu said, y'all aren't going anywhere. You better stay stay here in Mishu or you don't have a job if you decide to come back. And this guy who ran the test disappeared. Nobody ever heard from him again. <laughs> <laughs> the secretary and I were having a conversation and here comes the boss. And he says, uh, Norma and Sarah, I've got some documents for you, and I want you to go in the Chrysler section and give it to the man in the very last desk. We started walking. That place is so huge. I was exhausted halfway down there. Finally, we found, oh, but I forgot to tell you, the Chrysler uh People were there building the second stage. They saw me in Norma. It, women weren't supposed to be in this area. And so <laughs> they started screaming and hollering and throwing things at us. And we just tried to ignore them. And that walk was so long. And finally we got there and we handed the documents to this guy, the very last desk of the very last part of Mishu. And then we had to walk all the way back, and here comes the cat calls and the throwing stuff <laughs> and the screaming. And finally, we got back to our area at Mishu, and Norma was so mad, she took this document thing, and she slammed it on the boss's desk, and she stormed off, and I never saw her for the rest of the day. I was just so tired, I, I couldn't even get mad, but... <laughs> Anyway, I found out later that a lot of guys do this. They'll find some pretty girls, and they'll give them an errand to do just so the other bosses could see um, this boss's girls, and it was, you know, to look at the girls. And when we found out that, I wanted to kill him. But it was years after I found it out. Oh, yeah. While I was in college, I was unaware of this till much later. Uh, the phone was ringing in my parents' house. And it was some kind of a aid to President Johnson. And he kept asking my dad, said, uh, the president would like you to come up to the White House and be an advisor for me. Well, my dad kept turning them down, turning them down. And finally, as I learned later, President Johnson personally picked up the phone and called my dad. And he asked him, I need you as an advisor uh, for the oil and gas industry. So my dad, who was kind of stubborn, finally decided to go up there. And I thought, my dad had terrible temper. So did Lyndon Johnson. And I had this idea in my head of them getting in some kind of an argument and the Secret Service grabbing my, grabbing my dad and throwing me out on Pennsylvania Avenue. But much to my surprise, they loved each other, big buddies, big time. And I was so surprised, but I was happy that they didn't argue. <laughs> My dad loved to argue. Well, during the firings, the test firings, they would fire at night. Well, women couldn't be there because of the laws of Louisiana. 
You couldn't work overtime, and it pertained to doctors, lawyers, and professional women. Well, I'm sorry you got to go home because the law's here. Well, Sally got a bunch of gals up together, and they decided they were going to sue the state of Louisiana. And it was a whole bunch of women, uh, very professional, you know, doctors, lawyers, um, and like me, um, so anyway, they went and filed a lawsuit, and they won, and it was in all the papers, and there was great rejoicing because the women could work any time they wanted to, especially the professionals. And the doctor said, oh, well, we if you do this and we can't work, what are we going to do about our patients? And uh, so anyway, they won, and it was all over the country in the papers and it was wonderful so I could now go Sally and I my partner and I could go to the night firings and see the results well actually Apollo 11 was great but it was not my favorite mission that was Apollo 8 when we went around the moon and Earthrise came up, and we all saw it, and I all saw it on TV, and I started crying. It was beautiful. Everybody was compatible. Everybody was nice, and we were all excited of what we were doing because we were helping our astronauts get to the moon. And our first stage is the key thing for the Saturn V. If you don't have the first stage, you don't, don't go anywhere. They were engineers, and see, Boeing brought a whole bunch of employees down to Michu and probably the Cape and other place, places because Boeing got the contract, and they were wonderful people. Uh, just enjoyed being with them, but they weren't too keen on New Orleans because New Orleans food is very unique, and they didn't like a lot, <laughs> a lot of uh, Cajun cooking. Of course, I love it. The thing that's interesting is that it's raining in New Orleans a lot. It's a very, very damp atmosphere. And I would be coming to our section, and there was a door to the outside, and I saw all these people stomping the floor. And I said, what are you doing? And they would open the door and the crawfish would come in and they would be stomping the cat crawfish. And I said, you idiots. I said, they're good eating. Why are you stomping them? So I started gathering up the crawfish that were still alive, putting them in my skirt and throwing them out in the canal. And then I started hitting the guys. I said, don't you mess with these <laughs> crawfish. And I was hitting them. And later on, I walked in that area where the door was. And one of them said, don't mess with the crawfish. The crawfish lady's going to get you. <laughs> After Apollo, we moved back to Shreveport, Louisiana, where we're from. And my husband got in business with a partner, and they decided to be a fixed base operations for um, not for jets or, you know, small aircraft and Pipers and Cessnas and all those. So they said, my husband then said, would you like to learn how to fly? And I said, oh, wow, I'd love to. So they got me an instructor, and I did it all free because they owned the business, and the instructors were wonderful. They liked the way I flew. I obeyed everything they told me. I uh, sucked it up like a sponge. I love flying, and when I soloed for the first time, this is what they do to you. You land, you get out of the plane, and they... You wear this big T-shirt, and they come grab you, and they put all this writing on your T-shirt, and they 
put it on the bulletin board, and Sarah Caldwell made her flight first solo. And then from then on, uh, they couldn't stop, stop me. And then later on, my husband and his partner bought me a Piper Comanche, which is a very sophisticated airplane. And I loved my Comanche. I never had a problem. I never got in trouble. In fact, I flew all over East Texas. And I had this beautiful gold lame um, jump chute. And I would land <laughs> in the oil fields and get out of the plane. And they all the guys would just fall all over, <laughs> all over themselves. <laughs> because they're not used to seeing a girl flying. And for a time, I was a member of the 99s. Uh, which is the Women's Flight Club founded by Amelia Earhart. And it was a wonderful day. We would go on uh, luncheons and dinners and fly all over Louisiana and Arkansas and Texas. But the women stopped flying. And the reason was, the only reason they wanted to fly was to be able to land the plane in case their husbands had a heart attack, which I thought was absolutely hilarious. But anyway, after a while, they got tired of it, so they quit, they quit flying. Well, I've been very lucky, and I've always been enthusiastic, and a lot of people recognize that in me. If there was something that didn't feel right, and I, I could feel things, I would just walk away. I would not engage anyone in any kind of friction or bad uh, vibes or anything like that. I just can't do that. And I've been happy all my life, except for a few things, and just like everybody else. Uh, so... The things that uh, make me sad are cruelty to animals and cruelty to children. I just, that's, I just can't handle that. But anyway, other than that, I've been so fortunate. My dad paid me, paid my tuition to go to five colleges and universities. <laughs> Not full time. The only two I went full time was TCU Texas Christian University, and Louisiana State University. My dad, every summer when I was little, we went on vacation all over the country. Well, one time he said, we're going to New Mexico. And we were on, it says, White Sands National Monument on, uh, you know, like a big stone thing in the entrance. And all of a sudden... All of the cars, there were a lot of cars on the road, and they started pulling over. And my dad got out of the car, and we looked up, and here was this huge rocket going right over our heads. And I said, what was that? And my dad said, that was a rocket. That was the first time I ever saw one. And I said, oh, man, that is so neat. I really want to see another one. He said, oh, I'm sorry, but that's only one of the day. <laughs> then we went to White Sands, and we I played in the, in the sands. And there really is sands there. It's real sands. It's, uh, oh, I forgot the name of the mineral. But anyway, uh, that was the first time I ever knew or ever found out that the, that a rocket, I didn't know what a rocket was. And it had this long white trail, and it was going really fast. <laughs> and then I had a long singing career, and I have sung in uh, TCU's Choral Society, and I went, when we lived in uh, Virginia, I sang in one of the city choral societies it's not in that book and I enjoy singing but don't do it anymore and then there's all my animals 
I loved my animals. I had dogs from the time I was like four or five years old. And um, my present husband and I had a horse farm in Virginia. And we used to show our horses and I showed my dogs. And then we got into Civil War reenacting and my husband in, ended up being in two movies about the Civil War. And so we had a lot of friends all over the country and we would get in the car and go everywhere. We even, <laughs> he reenacted in New York. We reenacted in New Jersey, all the way to the end tip of Florida and all the places in between. Uh, there's a huge crowd of people that reenact Civil War battles every year. And the biggest one is at Gettysburg. Any time watching that? Or? Oh, yeah, I think it's wonderful. I love Elon Musk. He is a genius. And um, I can't remember the name of the president of Amazon. He got a huge... Bezos. Bezos, Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. He went down and found the first stage of the Saturn V of Apollo 11. That was so cool. You know what? You would think that my, my favorite astronaut would be one of the Apollos. Well, it was. My favorite astronaut was Alan Shepard. Because I was a member of the same church as he was. And he had a hard time. He had some problems, physical problems, and he wasn't. They were about to do away with him, say you can't go on Apollo. But he had a surgery that fixed him up, and he was able to go on a mission. And I was so pleased. And he just was a very, very nice guy. And. Uh, when I went, I, I gave an address to the astronomy club here in Columbia. And uh, I was feeling really bad that night. And I didn't give a good presentation, but they, I was impressed with them. They've got fabulous equipment. There's a, a guy here who's an astronomy, has his own observatory, and he bought himself a fancy drone money. <laughs> Money. <laughs> Money. We were in a lot of horse shows up in Virginia, mm -hmm. and it was a lot of fun. We made good friends, and we were all over horse farms and got to see a whole bunch of stuff that was a lot of fun, and we rode. Dudley got thrown one time. I got thrown one time. <laughs> well, what was cool about the horses, though, is we had a horse farm, we had a big pasture, and uh, we had a barn, they could go in and out of the barn. And I got up early one morning, and there were the horses bedded down with the deer. Oh. They loved each other. I was amazed, horses and deer come together like this. I had no idea till I saw it. My son, I'm so proud of him. Well, I'm proud of both of them, but he is a Marine, just retired from the Marine Corps. And uh, he had traveled all over the world with on his ships and everything. He flew Huey helicopters. And at one point, he applied for the Naval Postgraduate Academy in California. So he got his master's degree in electrical engineering. And the th interesting thing was that the things that I did, the work I did on Apollo in the first stage, was the th things that he, um, he learned in the Naval Postgraduate School, electrical engineering. And he ended up, teaching at the Naval Academy. He applied for it and he got it. And he was there for four years. Everybody's there for four years. So he said, Mom, he said, would you like to talk to the Naval Academy? And I said, oh my God, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, anyway, I went there and 
I was waving the uh, microphone. Thank you. The microphone around instead of speaking to it. But anyway, I had a great time. They loved me. They gave me a standing ovation. Um, and that time, this was in 2008, and they had gals there. And they were supposed to go to study hall after my presentation. Not a one of them left. <laughs> because... I'm one of the only two girls that worked as engineers on the Saturn V during Apollo. I've tried to look for any more. There weren't. There weren't. So it was me and Sally. But anyway, at the Naval Academy, I didn't finish. All the gals came down from the rafters. I mean, it's a huge auditorium. And they sit and standing there looking at me, grinning like from ear to ear because they found out you don't have any restrictions. You can do what you want to do, you know, and go for it. If you want to do something, just do it. Don't ask permission. Just go do it. That's what I did, and I never had a problem. Nobody ever told me no. Something funny happened on the way to the moon. And it is in the Smithsonian Library. Yes, I, I had published that book. It was for sale everywhere. And he did a dirty pool, stole my copyright, and the publisher and I decided just to take it off. And I found out what he did. I went to an attorney, and this is a what is called a millennium law. If you steal something from somebody else, you can get in deep trouble. Of course, that's the publishing company. They are the ones that do copyrights. Mm -hmm. And my publisher said, well, we can't do anything. They wouldn't do anything. So I cont contacted an, an attorney, and they said, well, give us a thousand dollars and we'll fix it. I don't have a thousand dollars. One thing in all my life, I've never been rich with money, but I have been rich in everything I've done, the people I've met, and I'm just very fortunate. So, money need, means nothing to me as long as I can keep food on the table and paying the rent. You know, I'm good. I think it's kind of a stra uh, very strange with Apollo that after it's all over, nobody was contacted anybody else as far as I know. I never saw another person that I worked with, and I'm sure they never saw anybody else either. Uh, Apollo was over. People were disheartened because they knew it. We all knew it was coming to an end, but it's a great chapter in American history and world history, too. But it's so sad that you know, I've never seen another person since. I've never talked to anybody that worked on Apollo. I'm, I know they're all over the country, but how do you contact anybody? No, we had this big brown paper rolled up. It was huge. And this is what they, this was all the leads stuck on the uh, stage to measure everything possible during the firing. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important ones that we watched for is the temperature. But we had PAM, PCM, and single sideband. Now, this is an electrical. Um, my son is an electrical engineer. This is all electrical engineering. And you know every lead and what it means. And if you've got an anomaly or you have a good firing. Most of the time, the Saturn, the first stage of the Saturn V was so well built. 
I have never worked on a piece of equipment like that. It was perfect. I mean, Warren Von Braun knew what he was doing, and he did it well. And one of the things that burns me up is all the people calling him a Nazi and all this stuff that's in the past in World War II, and I don't care. You know, uh, he was a genius, and it's a good thing President Kennedy found him, and they went all out to develop something to get to the moon as fast as they can. That was Von Braun's boyhood dream. He always wanted to go to the moon. In 1943, the year of my birth, a new volcano erupted in a cornfield in Mexico. And my mom talked me about, told me about all this stuff, and I got fascinated with volcanoes. And I've been all over and seen a lot of them. I've got a printout out here of all the volcanoes I've visited. I've been so lucky. Uh, I've not, the only one I saw erupting was Kilauea. And that's something else. Now it's really, really erupting. And uh, then the volcanoes are my favorite subject right now. You know, Apollo's done with it. We've been to the moon. It's over. And it was wonderful. But it's over. And I'd rather be interested in things that are going on right now. <laughs> you know? And there's so much in the world that's to see and experience. And I, not, I try to not let myself be sad over anything but of course I am because everybody is I guess my life has not been dull